Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jeff Shazinski and I'm a project manager and agriculture economist at the National Center for Appropriate Technology, more commonly known as NCAT. I will be assisting in broadcasting this <coughs> webinar, Pest Manage Management for Organic Production, Production Systems 2. NCAT is one of 11 organizations who have joined with the National Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, in a three-year National Conservation Innovation Project that is working to better integrate sustainable and organic agriculture production systems into NRCS programs and procedures. Part of this project is to provide critical information and training like this to NRCS staff, farmers, and others who may provide technical services to organic and sustainable farmers. We are grateful to NRCS for its funding and support of this webinar. This is the third in a series of five webinars uh, in this project, and I will, at the end of the webinar, uh, giving information about two upcoming in uh, August and September. The 11 organizations who are joining with NRCS and NCAT is, in this effort are the Center for Rural Affairs, the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, Midwest Organic Sustainable Education Service, <coughs> Organic Farming Research Foundation, Virginia Association for Biological Farming, Florida Organic Growers, Kansas Rural Center, Wild Farm Alliance, Land Stewardship Project, and Practical Farmers of Iowa. In addition to this project, one of the sustainable agricultural programs that NCAT manages, the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, which is better known as ATRA, provides publications, technical assistance through our telephone, hotline, and website, webinars, and other information to farmers, ranchers, and educators, extension agents, and others involved in sustainable agriculture across the country. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCAT's ATRA web page, www.atra.ncat.org, as well as through a link on the NRCS website. Our presenter today is Rex DeFour. We'll be discussing ecological friendly practice, practices that support organic pest management, including trap cropping, perimeter trap cropping, crop rotation, pheromone use, and other techniques, as well as their impact on pests and beneficials. This webinar builds on an earlier webinar, also available, as I said, on the APTRA and RCS websites. As you are listening to today's webinar, you can type in any question you might have in the field you see on your screen. And I'll gather them up, sort them out, and have Rex answer as many as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Uh, please don't be shy about asking questions. We won't be able to get to all of them during the webinar, but we will get back to you via email in the days to come. Also, before we begin, I just want to remind you, remind our, our viewers to take a few minutes to complete the survey we'll, we'll, you'll see on your screen after we close here. In fact, we always welcome your questions to ATRA. Uh, you're welcome to call our toll-free technical assistance line, 1-800-346-9140. We also invite you to go to our website, www.ncat.org, and click on the Ask an Expert button to send us a question by email. Don't worry if you didn't get the phone numbers or, or the website. They'll be on our, your screen at the end of the webinar. We respond to all the questions we receive, and this service is offered free of charge. Our presenter today is Rex DeFore. Rex is a project manager and program specialist for NCAT and heads NCAT's California office. Mr. DeFore's background is in entomology and integrated pest management. His work experience includes manage, managing sustainable development projects in Thailand and Laos. In addition to the ATRA project, he is currently involved in several minority and beginning farmer outreach projects. So it's time to get started. So let me turn things over to Rex. Thanks a lot, Jeff, um, for that. And so my name is Rex Tuhor. Good morning or afternoon, as the case may be, wherever you're at. I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you today about organic pest management. It's a very interesting and complex topic. And um, a small disclaimer before I start. Not everything I say today will be applicable to the situation in your particular area because this is a national audience, but it's my hope that if I can explain a bit about how and why these practices work, 
you'll be able to figure out how to adapt them to your area so they might be used or at least experimented with in your region. And I think experimentation and observation are keys to making these systems work. These are ecological approaches. Uh, there's no, you know, what I'm going to be giving you is a little bit the outlines of a recipe, but then for your particular landscape in your particular farm, uh, you'll have to customize it. So, uh, in, as uh, Jeff had mentioned in my previous webinar, which can be uh, accessed via this uh, URL on the slide, I discussed pretty general approaches to ecological pest management, particularly the importance of good soil management as a basic approach to good pest management. I also covered uh, weed and plant management using mulching and animal grazing, and also looking for on-farm opportunities to create habitat for beneficials through uh, finding places on your farm with hedgerows. As you can see in this slide, this farmer has made that something of a priority. Um, planting what I call biodiversity islands around irrigation structures, um, and even planting habitat in weedy corners of center pivots and other opportunities. But today I'm going to be talking about another type of ecological manipulation, uh, focusing on trap crops and perimeter trap cropping as habitat for pests and beneficials. Now it's important to remember that there may be constraints other than the local ecology to implementing some of these practices. You know, farmers have a lot of limitations on their labor, their time, their equipment, and even access to water. And those are some of the limitations that exist for uh, these trap cropping systems as well. However, on the flip side, these practices may be able to save the farmer time and money. So, <clears throat> excuse me. These two pictures show uh, two different approaches to intentionally including biodiversity in the cropping system. The picture on the left shows a hedgerow of native perennial plants next to a bedded field of. Um, cover crop to vetch and so these practices support biodiversity both above and below the ground. This this farmer, is a, he manages his soil quite well. He rotates his crops very well. Now on the right there's a picture um, of a trap crop, a strip of alfalfa in a cotton field. Now perimeter trap cropping or PTC as I'll refer to it is a variation on that trap cropping theme. Now these trap cropping systems are designed to meet farmers' needs for ecological manipulations that are targeted a bit more specifically to a particular pest or pest complex compared to, say, the general approach of just good agricultural practices, um, cover cropping, crop rotations, things like that. So a closer look at that um, at that field with the alfalfa strip in it. Um, now I'll be talking about a couple different trap cropping systems that were part of an NRCS funded conservation innovation grant I was um, I managed a few years ago. This cotton alfalfa system is was part of that and um, I collaborated with a group in California, uh, the Sustainable Cotton Project headed up by Marcia Gibbs. And this system is designed specifically for ligus bugs. Now, ligus, known out here, the species out here in California is the western tarnished plant bug, or ligus hesperus. They prefer alfalfa to cotton, and actually, ligus prefers alfalfa to just about any other crop. So it can be an excellent trap crop if you manage it properly. Now, you'll notice on your screen that the three rows on the right are a little bit younger. The ones on the left have begun to flower, if you can see that. And that's an important point. It's When managing alfalfa habitat, uh, it's important to keep part of it physiologically young because that is when it is still most attractive to lichens. So even when part of the alfalfa trap crop, crop is cut in this system, the lichens will migrate to the uncut uh, portion instead of migrating to the alfalfa. Uh, to the cotton. So, and alfalfa, if you've ever walked through an alfalfa field or done some sweeps in an alfalfa field, you know it's an ex excellent habitat for a lot of 
insects, including a lot of beneficial insects. So why would a farmer go to the trouble of planting this strip of alfalfa in the middle of his cotton field? Well, first, in this situation, the, the farmer is organic. So uh, many of the tools available to conventional growers to manage ligus is not available to this fellow. Um, and so there's kind of a short list of what I call ideal pest attributes for trap cropping. Um, and ligus, for example, is a perennial pest of cotton. So most farmers are not going to go to the trouble of planting a trap crop unless it's uh, you're dealing with a, a perennial pest, something that's there every year. Uh, ligus is there every year. And uh, it's relatively abundant. It can cause economic damage every year because it stings or feeds on the developing bowl called a square. And then on the older bowl, its feeding can prevent the bowl from opening properly. And then uh, you get a decreased harvest of cotton. So it's, it, it's a perennial economic pest. And then also, it trap cropping works best with pests having relatively limited mobility. It won't be as effective with pests that are very strong flyers or those that are dispersed via winds such as um, aphids, thrips, mites perhaps. Um, in this case, ligus adults are, are reasonably good flyers but their nymphs don't fly so they are not very mobile and so in this system it, it seems to work pretty well in this system. But it's very important to know the life cycle of the pest. That's that's very critical. I'm going to digress just for a second because I've seen some some presentations about trap cropping suggest that having to understand a pest's life cycle is a disadvantage and I think that I just don't agree with that. I think uh, knowledge in this case is power and knowing about the pest life cycle is definitely an advantage whether you're doing trap cropping or not. Um, this knowledge can provide information about where and how the pest may enter the cash crop field. It might be from your neighbor's crop or it could be from the adjacent hills in California here. Once the hills dry out, um, the ligus will migrate down from the hills into uh, green crops. But if you're next to a safflower field, maybe once that safflower is cut, they might come in from there. Um, depending on the pest, Maybe it comes in from the forest, or from a tree line, or from a hedgerow. So the more you understand about how the pest uses the landscape, uh, you can do kind of an ecological jujitsu using the pest's preferences or their strengths to your advantage. And then knowing the pest life cycle will also provide some insight into the duration and the level of pest influx. Um, certainly this will vary year to year, but uh, if you know that on dry years uh, you tend to have more of this particular kind of pest, that's knowledge you can use. And then understanding all these factors will provide input to the farmer uh, as to how much land they need to put into trap crops. And I think perhaps using the word sacrifice to trap crops is perhaps a bit strong, but um, the farmer does need to put some kind of land, some amount of land into a trap crop and that's why multifunctional trap crops is, is much more of an ideal situation because a farmer will be much more willing to plant a trap crop if he can say harvest uh, the trap crop if it's not too damaged or if it provides you know habitat for multiple beneficials or perhaps traps more than one pest. Um, but perhaps most importantly, uh, it's important that the, the planting and maintenance of the trap crop needs to be fit within the farmer's production system. And that includes uh, important considerations of the farmer's equipment and labor availability. And those are, are pretty key. So here's a, another picture of that same system um, at a earlier phase, you know, when the, you know, it's the Alfalfa on the right was just cut. Uh, the ligus had migrated to the um, un 
the older alfalfa in on the left. So um, seems to work pretty well for this farmer. He's used it um, two or three years in a row. So, but Ligus is not just a pest in um, in cotton. It's also a pest in strawberries, which is a very valuable crop out here in the West. Some organic and conventional growers are using alfalfa uh, planted on about 2% of their land, about one row of alfalfa every 45 or 50 rows. And uh, then they will use these bug vacs, which are tractor-mounted vacuums, to literally vacuum the ligus from the alfalfa. Now, the old practice was uh, vacuuming whole fields. And you can imagine if you're just vacuuming about 2% of your field rather than the whole field, uh, the time in labor, in equipment, in you know, energy costs that can be saved. So in, in this system, it's about 2 to 2.5% 2 of the total acreage planted in strawberries is planted to alfalfa. So the, the farmer, one of the farmer collaborators that uh, was the original I guess, farmer to implement this kind of system is now doing it in uh, 75 acres of organic as well as 50 acres of conventional uh, ground. And that's a lot of strawberries. And so it, sh it works both in organic and conventional systems. Now here's a picture of that tractor mounted uh, bug back. This is a, a three vacuum system. They come as large as six. There's about 50 of these machines of various sizes in use in California and elsewhere. Um, now you notice the center row is alfalfa here, but he's also vacuuming the adjacent rows of strawberries, and that's where uh, the highest ligus population is likely to be. Um, on the left, column of pictures you can see the ligus and then below that there's a picture of the kind of damage that the feeding of the ligus on the younger strawberry does. It's called cat feasting and then below that is a picture of the ligus parasite. Now for smaller operations there are backpack mounted bug vacs. Backpack bug vac uh, that can be used um, so you don't need this monster investment of these tractor-mounted vacuums. Uh, Rincon Vitova Insectaries, among others, uh, if you Google them or Google Backpack Bug Vac, uh, you can find places uh, to purchase these. So the next few slides revolve around a peanut sorghum and cotton trap cropping system. This also was part of an uh, the same NRCS conservation innovation grant that I did with collaborators. Uh, we had collaborators in California, Georgia, and also in Arizona. And uh, we were looking for ways to reduce the heavy pesticide loads in cotton. And so um, the collaborator here was Dr. Gwen Tillman. Um, she works out of an ARS office in South Georgia. And this is a uh, the problem in in the South with, with or one of the problems, uh, pest problems, in the South is that um, oftentimes peanuts and cotton are in neighboring fields and when the peanuts are harvested, stink bugs, both green and brown variety, will migrate from the peanuts to the adjacent cotton fields and then create damage similar to uh, some of the damage that ligus do. So in these pictures, the, the sorghum was planted as a trap crop for stink bugs and uh, also uh, as a habitat for minute pirate bugs which feed on the sorghum pollen and which also are stink bug egg predators. This slide shows um, the sorghum. It's actually two different plantings of sorghum. The, on the right you can see the sorghum is heading out, on the left is the younger sorghum and you can see these strange yellow structures. Those are stink bug traps and beyond that um, to the right is the cotton field. I mean the uh, peanut field, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. So the far right is the peanut crop. Um, just uh, another view of the different ages of, of the sorghum. Um, here you can see the younger sorghum adjacent 
to the cotton crop on the left. Um, so in this system, <laughs> when the peanuts are dug and windrow, the stink bugs will look for another green crop. And the first thing they encounter is a relatively tall, statured row of sorghum. So not only is it kind of the food source for the the stink bugs, but it also physically it's it's a somewhat of a physical barrier to them, so they'll tend to stop and rest there. So here are a couple of green snake bugs in the sorghum trap top. Uh, you notice there's a little circle around the thorax of, of the one on the left, and uh, that white circle centers on uh, a tachinid egg. Now, tachinids are a, uh, a parasitic fly that preys on, on stink bugs, among others, and uh, this egg will hatch out in, in an alien-like fashion. It will bore into the stink bug and eat it from the inside out and then uh, pupate and uh, oftentimes drops to the soil, and then you get the adult fly coming out. This is a, this, a green stink bug nymph again in the uh, sorghum trap crop, and on the left shoulder or the left pronotum, you can see another tachinid egg. So it, the sorghum was not only a, a good source and habitat for the minute part of it, but it also uh, seemed to be a pretty good place for to kind of flies to hang out. So again, this system was done in a conventional setting, not organic, but it does point to some possibilities for organic production systems. Um, it did prevent stink bugs from migrating into cotton, not 100%, but it did slow that migration down, and it did save the grower a pesticide application compared to its neighbors. Um, so and looking at the attributes of a pest to be trap crop, stink bugs are a common problem in cotton. Uh, they can be a problem almost every year. The only concern I would have about this uh, this particular system is that there are two planting dates for the sorghum and as well as potentially two harvest dates for the sorghum and that's uh, a point you want to remember about what will you do with the trap crop? Are you going to plow it under? Are you going to sell it? Do you have a market for the trap crop in case you do get a harvest? So as with any ecological manipulation, trap crops or perimeter trap cropping systems, which I'll talk about next, will work most effectively in organic systems that are using the other good practices that are recommended um, for organic systems such as uh, good soil management, diverse rotations, mulching, creating perennial habitat and annual habitat. These other practices provide the diverse checks and balances that prevent pests from uh, overwhelming the system. So I'm going to be talking about perimeter trap cropping now and you can see this is a regular trap cropping on the left, perimeter trap cropping. Um, there's a row of squash around, of, of a particular type of squash around um, a summer squash here. Now some things to keep in mind with perimeter trap cropping is that the timing and the stage of the plant is very critical. Uh, perimeter means just that, you know, you need to have a perimeter on each row side, you know, as you're planting transplants or uh, direct seeding in the uh, on the row side, which is uh, where the arrow is pointing, there's kind of two row sides and then there's the row ends and you also need to plant uh, whatever trap crop you're planting two plants to nine plants deep on the ends of the rows in order to get an effective perimeter. Um, with larger fields, you're sacrificing, you end up planting relatively less acreage to trap crops relative to smaller fields because the trap crop actually doesn't, generally doesn't change in width 
for size in the larger fields other than just to cover the larger perimeter. Um, but it's you're sacrificing relatively less land in larger fields. Uh, another point, trap crops have to be maintained throughout the duration of the pest pressure season. Otherwise, the cash crop will be damaged. And organic growers need to have a strategy for dealing with whatever high pest populations end up being in the trap crop. So that's a very important consideration. Um, and knowing the pest life cycle again is very important. So I'm going to go into a few more specific examples here. Cucumbers and squash and other um, cucurbits, melons, um, pumpkins, they're very commonly grown crops by a lot of organic farmers. Uh, the striped cucumber beetle as well as the spotted cucumber beetle are perennial problems. <clears throat> and so um, Jude Butcher um, in the East Coast has experimented around with these perimeter trap cropping systems using Hubbard squash, which is a species of Cucurbita maxima. So there are several different cultivars within that species of Cucurbita maxima. Hubbard squash is one of them. It's not the only one that is very attractive to um, cucumber beetles. But generally speaking, in this, the, the rule of thumb is one to three rows of Hubbard squash on either side, and then two to six plants at the end of each row. Now, organic growers, um, for control of the, the cucumber beetle populations, and they need to be controlled, uh, can use pyrethrum. That works pretty well. Entrust is uh, more expensive and less effective. And depending on the pest pressure, you may want to apply some kale and clay. Oh, now the formulation is called surround. It's, it's a particle film barrier to the adjacent rows of the cash crop, um, depending on the pest pressure. Okay. It's important to rotate summer squash plantings. I know um, half a mile is, is a bit much to ask a lot of these smaller growers, but you want to rotate away, as far away from the previous summer squash plantings um, as you can, because that will help reduce the cucumber beetle populations. Uh, you need to begin scouting the outer trap crop rows for cucumber beetles as soon as the plants emerge. If you direct seed, or within a day or two after transplanting, if you're if you're transplanting. Um, Particular attention needs to be paid to the trap crop rows along border trees or hedgerows because uh, the cucumber beetles uh, like to overwinter in those areas and then those are places where the early colonization will be coming from. And you should scout for the beetles uh, about twice a week. As I said before, you need to prevent the um, beetle populations from killing and overrunning the perimeter plants. Otherwise, you gonna, you're going to lose their effectiveness and you'll have problems in the uh, cash crop. It'll be able to, this system can deal with um, low to moderate beetle populations up to about maybe five beetles per trap crop plant. But you know, in your monitoring, if they start approaching that level, you need to treat. Uh, a green summer squash like zucchini is more attractive to the beetles than a yellow squash. Uh, you may need to uh, be treating a, the trap crop more frequently in that case or maybe uh, treat the outer edges of the actual cash crop. <coughs> Excuse me. One advantage of this uh, perimeter trap cropping with, with the squash is that the bacterial the incidence of bacterial wilt in the cash crop is, is significantly reduced. The bacterial wilt is spread by cucumber beetles defecating on the uh, damaged areas they've been feeding on. Um, the PTC system may also reduce the incidence of mosaic viruses, powdery mildew, and black rot. And it also, this same system can be used to manage the squash vine borer, um, which is a a fairly frequent pest. 
Um, but you have to monitor the, the adult moths using a pheromone where a uh, Hercon brand squash vine borer pheromone and you use a sentry that's sentry as in you know a scent of something sentry heliothis trap and then if you find more than five squash vine borer adults per week in the trap you need to spray the trap out. and finally well semi-finally um, there's a species or a cultivar of Cucurbita maxima called Turks turban that is a major reservoir uh, for the bacteria wilt and so you want to avoid that and you gaps larger than 15 feet in your perimeter is like having a, a bridge over a moat you're you're providing an entryway for pests and so that will render the whole perimeter trap cropping scheme ineffective so keep those gaps very very small you can get a lot more information about this system and other systems, uh, trap cropping systems, at uh, the website noted here. And um, ATRA also has quite a few resources on on this. Um, we have something called the Organic IPM Field Guide. We need to devote a whole page. That's the uh, there's a figure of it on your right. It's page six. A whole page on. Um, what are the most the species of cucurbits that are most attractive to cucumber beetles as well as uh, the species that are least attractive um, on the left is uh, the publication Atra has on cucumber beetles it's a very comprehensive pub well written and covers some of the trap cropping ideas presented here as well so um, moving on to pepper maggots pepper maggots is another um, system that uh, G. Butcher has researched it's actually an eastern pest, though. Uh, if you drew a line between Texas and Ontario, um, the economic damage will be east of that line. But so this um, pepper maggot, the damage can be very significantly reduced by planting uh, a hot cherry pepper or some other cultivars related to that around sweet bell peppers. It works very effectively. So commercial farmers using <clears throat> excuse me, perimeter trap cropping were able to harvest a lot cleaner fruit. Uh, but there are some considerations. This website here has a lot more detail about some of the nooks and crannies of this system. But let me just cover a few here. Um, the fly enters from the tree line. They forage up it for food up in tree canopies, they, they seem to favor maples, uh, and then they'll infest the plants along the edge of the tree line first, and so that has implications for how you want to um, design your crop. Um, maybe put the rows, you know, put the rows parallel to the tree line because that will be an easier way to make that trap crop border wider than doing them the way they did it here in the picture on the right. Um, you need to start monitoring the flies in July and there's a couple different options to monitoring the flies. You can stick a sticky trap 20 feet up in the tree canopy which makes it a little bit of difficulty to monitoring or you can uh, in the lower left of this slide you can monitor the hot cherry peppers for overposition scars and those are kind of hard to see. They're, they're pretty tiny but if you have a hand lens, if the farmer has a good sharp eyes, uh, you can see them. They're about a couple millimeters wide. And once you start seeing those then you have to you want to start applying uh, some kind of control measure to the trap crop. This will work on moderate pest populations uh, with only one application and you for um, organic growers it would be something like pyrethrum, pyganic, something along those lines. Uh, for higher pest pressure you may require it may require two to three trap crop sprays. Um, if this is a big problem in your system though that it's much better to just um, manage the pest in the in the narrow trap crop 
uh, border in the whole field, though, and you can probably save some time and money. Um, hot cherry peppers are preferred. Apple pimiento is uh, one cultivar. España is another cultivar. Keep in mind that eggplants and horse nettles are also hosts. In fact, horse nettle is the original native um, plant host. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about weed control and in your crop rotation systems. You, know, you don't want to rotate your pepper crop into a field that has had solanaceous crops prior to that. Okay, And then remember that these pests overwinter as pupae in the soil where the host crop is grown. So um, keep that in mind. I'll talk about some possible control measures for that later on. So enough about hot cherries. Um, diamondback moth, this is a very common pest on a lot of crucifers, kale, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, a lot of others. In my work in Thailand, I, I worked with this critter a little bit. And uh, this is actually part of a globalized pest complex. Uh, diamondback moth, the cabbage looper, and the cabbage moth. It's the same big three pests in Thailand as it is in the US, which I thought was somewhat interesting. So the researchers in Florida were able to manage this pest by using a trap crop of collards. And you can see that bottom left picture. There's a couple rows of collards. Uh, the collards were transplanted uh, in early spring at the same time as the cabbage transplants. So they used two rows of collards on the two row edges and then at the row ends they would transplant seven to nine seedlings. So that would give a pretty good perimeter. They used uh, the collard cultivars VATES, that's V as in Victor, A-T-E-S, um, Georgia or Champion they all worked pretty well. For plantings later in the spring or early summer, uh, the collard should be planted maybe a week or two in advance because they are a little bit slower growing than the cabbage crop. But one of the nice things about this system is that unless you plan to market the collard greens, you generally don't have to spray the trap crop because the diamondback larvae are parasitized at a very high rate by an ichneumonid wasp uh, that's attracted to actually the damage or the, the scent that the damaged collards give off. But uh, you still should monitor both the trap crop and also the uh, first rows of the, of the cash crop because if the lepidopter larvae, diamondback moth, or others exceed the action threshold, um, you organic growers need to control them. The controls include Intrust, which is a spinosad formulation that's uh, okay for use in organic production system, uh, some formulation of BT, or even uh, uh, army registered neem formulation. Those are all options. This same system can be used for flea beetle control, but uh, you need to replace the colored greens with something called the giant uh, Chinese giant mustard, which, which is a, the seeds of this are readily available in most locations. So, um, so I've just covered a few trap cropping ideas here. There's lots of potential out there. I think we just kind of scratched the surface on these ecological manipulations. Um, there are s some other folks doing work, uh, particularly in the south it seems. Uh, there seems to be a hot spot of trap cropping research. There's some information there, uh, contact information for some other folks doing trap cropping research. Uh, even you know farmers are, are good observers and this picture here shows an amaranthus. It's a kind of a decorative amaranthus that a local farmer here outside of Davis uses to protect his cucumbers and squash. The, cu the cucumber beetles feed on the leaves of this thing and then uh, preferentially they prefer this to the squash plants and then he sells the heads as an ornamental you know dried cut flower. Um, 
a lot of folks seem to be using sorghum as a trap crop. What about um, integrating sorghum as a trap crop for stink bugs and pecans? You know, I think there's a lot of potential for research here. Either you know, Western SARE, um, on-farm research could be a conservation innovation type grant. Um, but there's a lot of research potential here. But just to recap very briefly on kind of trap cropping or perimeter trap cropping considerations, the more functional the trap crop is, uh, the more benefits the farmer sees, uh, the more likely that they will use that. In the, and that includes the easier it is for the farmer to use that system, then the better off um, he is and the more likely he is to use that system. Knowledge of the pest is very critical to this kind of system because you, you need to know its life cycle, you need to know its habits, you know, when it uh, will migrate in, um, the kind of damage. And you also need to um, have some idea about what abilities your trap crop has to withstand damage, how attractive it is um, to the pest relative to your cash crop, and then also what are the options for controlling the pest once you have it in the trap crop. It's kind of like the dog chasing the car. Once the dog catches the car, what's he going to do with it? Um, oops, let me go back there. A couple other considerations, I think. Sorry, I want to go back to that one. Um, system integration. How well does do these practices, uh, uh, trap cropping, fit in with your crop rotation, your field placement, your soil fertility and fertility management? Um, how well do they fit in and how well do your other practices support your pest management? And so this picture actually, um, I hope you can indulge me just for a minute or so. A, a few thoughts about diversity and agricultural ecosystems. This picture shows a cover crop or an alley crop in uh, in a vineyard. It wouldn't really be considered a trap crop, uh, but that's why I'm showing this picture. The idea of a trap crop is, is a very useful concept, uh, but it also perhaps tends to mirror our thinking a little bit. Nature doesn't really work in trap crops per se, or green manures, or any particular functional unit. Nature works through diversity. A trap crop provides habitat to many more species than just a particular pest or pest complex, just as this uh, alley crop provides more than just a cover to the soil. It's habitat for spiders, for ground beetles, for a lot of other insects, including a few pest species probably. But the vast majority of the critters in a trap crop or in an alley um, are either will be generally beneficial or neutral. Neutral meaning it they don't attack the crop; um, they're just there. They like the plant, whatever. But they provide perhaps food for generalist predators or other parasites that may be beneficial for your system. In addition, you know. This alley, the plants in this alley, secrete a unique spectrum of chemicals as root exudates, which contribute to the diversity below ground. That is also true when you rotate crops or when you intercrop. You, know, you get a diverse bunch of microbial, a diverse microbial community growing in the soil. Um, We'll never know all the interactions, the complex interactions that take place between the plants and the soil and the insects and the spiders and all the other critters in this system, which is overlaid by you know, the variability of the weather. But it's the sum of all of these interactions which help make organic systems, I think, more resilient than the average conventionally managed system. So if you add biodiversity, you know, that's, that's generally a good thing. So um, we're on just about the last few minutes. There's only about uh, seven or eight more slides I wanted to cover a few more points. Uh, one thing about pheromones, it's a, it's a very good and useful tool for organic growers. They can generally be used in three ways, I think, um, as pest management tools. 
they can be used as monitoring, a monitoring tool, pest monitoring, so in order to time control measures. They can be used as a mass trapping strategy, or as this photo shows, uh, this is an apple tree up in uh, Walla Walla, Washington. Pheromone confusion, so used to disrupt mating, and in this case it's a mating of the codling moth by making it more difficult for the males to find the females. So it, it disrupts egg laying. So any of these companies listed here under traps or lures, if you Google them, you'll be able to find a, a really wide variety of pheromones or traps. Another somewhat random thought. Um, I've done a lot of work with uh, integrating chickens in cropping systems lately here under another grant. We've talked a lot about adding plant biodiversity to a system, but I think animals are kind of left out sometimes for a number of management considerations mostly. But, um, think about this. Chickens evolved to search for little packets of protein and nutrition like seeds and insects. Chickens can be moved relatively easily, and they can provide very important pest management for crops. Their very nature, they search the top layer of the soil where a lot of insects, yeah, pests included, spend at least part of their life cycle as a pupa, overwintering stage, as a larva, uh, perhaps eggs. So this is one way to increase the environmental pressure against the pest. Um, keep in mind chickens also eat weed seeds, they graze on weeds, and they can provide a good dose of soil fertility but it, certainly there are some, some major management considerations, but um, diversity includes animals, so um, if you can do it, it's great. Before I finish, I just wanted to cover uh, a couple more resources under NCAT's ATRA page. This is the Biorationals page or the Ecological Pest Management page. Um, it's, a, I think, a pretty good resource. You can search by pest, by active ingredient, or by trade name. Um, it's fairly easy to use. Uh, the information you get can, will denote whether a pesticide is listed under the Organic Materials Review Institute. It also has links to labels and manufacturers' contact information. And so I'm going to just take you through very briefly um, how to use this. You select a pest type, disease, insect, mollusk. You know, once that is selected, then uh, in this case we selected insect. Uh, you can search either for the common name or for scientific name. Uh, you click on whichever critter you're looking after, and then you um, hit the search button, and a table will be generated. The table has uh, links to labels. It has links to manufacturers, contact information, lots more. Um, it'll but anyway, it's, it's a useful tool for you, um, and it also provides prevention information. Up right under the biorationals, the word biorationals, if there's information in the pest prevention field, you can click on that and you'll find there's information about preventing the pest, not just uh, remedial pesticides are, are given in this database, there's pest prevention information as well. So. And one last resource, um, it's kind of the web version of our toll-free line. Just ask an ag expert. You can ask a question about any aspect of sustainable organic production or marketing, crops or animals, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. So like all agriculture, well, agricultural systems, you know, organic farming is a challenge. It varies year to year with the weather, with the different crops and other variables. Just enhancing biodiversity can really help your bottom line um, and provides a more stable system with more checks and balances. So if you have any questions about anything I said, I'd be happy to take any questions now or maybe turn it back over to Jeff. Uh, thank you, Rex. Uh, yeah, we have had a, a number of questions, and we'll try to get uh, some of them overlapped, but hopefully 
and some of them were kind of answered in the process. So uh, one uh, question was, is there a list of trap crops by region in the United States? And that was even suggested as a possible research project. It's a great, um, that's a great idea. I think it's, that would be a really, maybe a, make a really good atropub. Um, I don't know of any list of trap crops used in the U.S. at this point. Um, I tried to develop kind of, well I searched for um, as much information as I could, but you know, farmers are always developing their own ideas. Um, but no, not that I know of. There's no list, comprehensive list of trap crops that are used in the U.S., but I think that would be a great, it's a great resource and a great idea for a, a, a SEER project, for example. Um, I think you touched on this, Rex, but there was a, a very, at the early, there was a very specific uh, question about the squash vine borer as in uh, methods of, organic methods of uh, protecting or or dealing with that pest. And I think you did address that, but maybe just one more time. Well, um, the squash vine borer, I think if you go to that particular, um, I think I referenced a, a page that Jude Butcher right. has developed. Um, there are other, the, the problem with a squash vine borer is that um, it lays its egg and then the, the larvae bore into the vine itself. So it's, if you don't get the egg stage of the borer, um, or if you don't use a trap crop to kind of deal with it, once it's inside the vine, there's really no good systemics uh, that deal with it. It's pretty protected in there unless you want to go and squirt um, like formulations, inject formulations of Bavaria bassiana or BT into your affected vine. And you can tell the affected areas because um, they'll start wilting as the larva starts feeding on the inside, you know, the cambium layers on the inside of the vine. Um, it starts looking less and less thrifty. But I think um, you, you can probably find more information at, at that website that uh, G. Butcher runs as far as how to run that trap cropping system. There was a, a couple, <clears throat> Rex, a couple of questions. Uh, trap crops in perennials or in orchards. Uh, there was even one specific to peach orchards, but I, and I think you did address that somewhat. But uh, so I, I am assuming, I guess the question is basically, are these methods available for orchards and perennial crops? You know, there's a guy out here in California, uh, and I, his name escapes me right now, but I've, um, I do have a few slides about, he has used sunflowers as a trap crop. Well, actually, it's a, it's a kind of a complex system, but uh, there's an Asian, an, uh, there's a pest of, of um, peaches that came in from Asia, and I, that name escapes me at the moment as well. But the way this trap cropping system works in sunflowers is that if you plant sunflowers around the perimeter or in the in say alternate alleys of a peach orchard, um, you'll get a a lep larva that feeds on the seed heads of the sunflower crop. Now this provides an overwintering host for the parasitic wasp that attacks this Asian, it's an Asian peach borer I think, um, because the Asian peach borer apparently doesn't overwinter in a way that the wasp parasite, uh, that works very well with the wasp parasite's um, life cycle. So what they do is provide a host habitat for the sunflower head borer, which provides an overwintering host for the parasite of the um, Asian lep pest, and I, again, the name escapes me. But, uh, so, the following spring you have a population of these parasites that can start attacking um, the population of the, the Asian pest. So there is there is a system out there. If you, 
I think if you Google peaches and sunflowers, uh, you might get some weird pictures. But uh, this the guy that does that research in the Central Valley, uh, some of his research will come up. Or just write me, and I can send you a few slides, uh, PowerPoint slides about that uh, system. Uh, thanks. Uh, one, one quick last one, and I thought it was kind of interesting. How do farmers dispose of vacuumed pests? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's an interesting question. I think, um, well, this is a, a, a place where uh, chickens come in again, I guess. That's one option. I think you could just, um, you know, freeze them. Uh, one other aspect of that system I forgot to mention, though, uh, by avoiding vacuuming that whole crop, you know, there had been, when they were doing the whole crop, the whole field vacuuming, uh, they would suck up powdery mildew spores and effectively distribute them around the whole field. So they started increasing their powdery mildew problems by vacuuming the whole field, and then this trap crop of alfalfa helped mitigate that. But, um, yeah, as far as, dis I guess you could just toss them. Sometimes these vacuums kind of chew up the pests pretty well. So, okay. Um, thank you. I think that's about uh, all we have time for, and there's a few a few extras, but we'll um, uh, leave that for you. Again, we'll be in touch with you later. Um, the webinar will, again will be posted uh, in the next few days. I know the folks here; they'll probably have it up even this afternoon. They're usually really good at it. Um, uh, and we'll be back to you about any questions you had and weren't answered during the webinar. And other questions occur to you, again, you can call our hotline or ask the ag expert at the at website. And then finally, I wanted to remind you of uh, two additional webinars uh, that came from this conservation innovation project. Uh, one of them is coming up quite quickly, actually, it's and it's entitled Organic Crop Rotations. Uh, conservation benefits, which will be uh, led by actually a, a, a dual team of Harriet Bihar from Moses or the Midwest Organic and Sustainable Education Service and Mark Schoenbeck from the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. And that will be on August 14th uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And we'll be sending out uh, a lot of alerts on that. But again, contact us if you want the details. On that, and then we're, um, finally in the late September, September 27th, again at one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I guess it's daylight saving time now. Uh, uh, links between biodiversity requirements of organic systems and NRCS practice standards. It's a little more, again, specific to NRCS, but it um, again is uh, picking up the topic we somewhat touched on in terms of biodiversity diversity, and that will be uh, run by Joanne Baumgartner from the Wild Pharma Alliance uh, based in California. So again, thank you for attending today's w webinar, and um, feel, again, feel always feel to contact us.